At this time, please turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 15. We're going to be diving into God's Word and watch His undying love. Once you've found Mark chapter 15, please stand out of joyful reverence for the reading of God's encouraging Word. Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 16, reads, And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in purple, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put on his clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled the passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to to decide which or what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and and the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews, and with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads, saying, Ah, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. This is the truth. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. When I was 15, as my family and I were on vacation, uh, we stopped at a gas station in the middle of some cornfield in Nebraska, and I stayed in the truck, window was down, and my dad went out to fill up the truck with gas, and as he was at the gas pump, he struck up a conversation with another camper uh, at the gas pump on the opposite side. And somehow my dad turned the conversation to the point where he was just incessantly bragging about his oldest son, my oldest brother, Nate. Nate, he had the highest batting average, set the record for the highest batting average in high school in baseball. He set the record for the number of goals scored in the season in soccer. He got a full ride to college. He played AAA for the Dodgers. And when I heard my dad bragging about my oldest brother, I was like, of course! Of course he would be bragging about him. So I tried to tune the conversation out, but I wasn't able to. And thankfully, I wasn't able to. Because later in that conversation that he was having, he started lifting up my other brother, Luke. Started pointing out all of the highlights, all of the strong points. Then he did it with David, and then he finally did it with me. It's like, yes! And then he did it with my brother, Matt. Then he did it with Jane to some random stranger at a gas station in the middle of Nowheresville, Nebraska, which is all of Nebraska. (laughs) He was bragging about all of us. And that may seem like an insignificant moment, but I remember every single word, and it's been 18 years. Listen, the amount of confidence and personal value a father can instill in their child is off the charts. It is off the charts. And just like a father can do that, Jesus, through His loving sacrifice, is going to do that for us today. 
He, through his word, through his sacrifice, through his suffering, through his derision, we are going to be filled with confidence. Filled with the unmistakable fact that we have unparalleled value in the eyes of the most important person, the God, the creator of this universe. That's what we're going to see today. Like a father's love can fill us with confidence and personal value, Jesus is going to do that for us today in an unparalleled, match, unmatchable fashion. Look at verse 16. It says, And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. Let me give you a little bit of context. What happened in Mark chapter 14? Jesus was unjustly accused. Jesus was unjustly condemned. Jesus was unjustly beaten and mocked by the Jews. And then in chapter 15, what do we see at the beginning of the chapter? We see that all repeating. We see the Jews bring Jesus before Pilate and falsely accuse him. We see Pilate in his weakness, even though he knows that Jesus is innocent beyond the shadow of a doubt, he's so concerned for himself, he unjustly condemns Jesus. And before they hurl a cross on Jesus' back and lead him out to Calvary, two things happen. First, Jesus is scourged. That means he was stripped naked, tied to a post, and beaten with a whip designed to rip chunks of flesh off his person and expose his skeleton. Second, Jesus was brought, as we see in verse 16, to this battalion, to this cohort, which is a tenth of a legion, which is 600 soldiers. He's brought before these 600 soldiers who incessantly mock him and treat him like the biggest, most pathetic joke there is. Look at verse 17. And they clothed him in purple, in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. Now I'm going to tell a story at this point and it may seem to have nothing to do with what this says, but eventually we'll get back to it, okay? So just listen. When I was 16, July 4th, went to my cousin's house at night, end of the July 4th, and uh, it started out as a great night. And... My cousin, who was a kickboxer, an awesome kickboxer, uh, decided it would be fun with the 20, 20 or so guys that we had there to bust out the boxing gloves. And he had a lot of boxing gloves. And so we had a little fight club. And you know what? It was fun. It wasn't like anyone was beating each other down. You know what? We were restraining ourselves a little bit. That is until my brother David and I got in the ring. And... As you might expect, being brothers, it just kept on being one up and one up and one up until it was a, it was a full-on battle. And I would so love to lie to you <laughs> and say, I just totally worked him over, just totally destroyed him. But the truth is, he beat the snot out of me. I mean, I was spitting up blood. I was seeing stars. It was all spinning. I was in pain. It hurt. But you want to know what was even worse than the pain that I did also feel for the next couple days? You want to know what was worse? It was after that royal beating from my other brother, all of the guys laughing, all of the guys mocking, all of the... I would have much rather been beaten senseless by my brother ten more times than to, have heard, to, than to have heard any of that. Listen, throughout this text, in this portion of the Gospel account, Jesus' crucifixion, and in every other account, what is the focus? The focus is not on the physical suffering of Jesus. Does he suffer immensely? Does he suffer incredibly? Is it horrific? Absolutely. The physical suffering is absolutely 
horrific, but that is not the primary focus of this account or any other account. There are no adjectives to describe the scourging. It's just mentioned matter of fact. There are no adjectives. There are no sensational, in-depth, gory details of the crucifixion. It all is just mentioned. This happened. What is the focus of every gospel account at this point? It's one of two things. It's either the sovereignty of God, that God in every single aspect is doing exactly what he wants to do, providing salvation through you, for you and for me through his son Jesus Christ. It's either that or it's the mockery. It's the shame. It's the fact that Jesus is made out by everyone to be a pathetic, a pathetic joke. That's the focus here. We come to this passage, we come to verse 17, and we see that. We see Jesus mocked incessantly. It's absolutely disgusting. You can see, you can imagine the moment. You have 600 people, three times the size of the number of people in this church, 600 men standing before Jesus. And you can just imagine how this plays out. The comedian of the group grabs the crown of thorns. He grabs the robe. He grabs also a stick that's supposed to be Jesus' mighty scepter. And he walks up to Jesus and says, you know, every king needs his crown and jabs it into his skull. You can see him wrapping the purple robe, symbol of royalty, on his shredded back and saying, doesn't that fit well, almighty king? You can see him handing the scepter and saying, every, sept- every king has its royal scepter. You can see the spit. You can see him priding him with the reed and slapping him across the face. It is humiliation 600 strong. It is a horrific, horrific moment. And yes, on one hand, we should read this and be so disgusted. But on the other hand, this moment should fill us to the brim and then some with encouragement. Why? Just think about it. What happened in John 18 right before this in the Garden of Gethsemane? Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and what comes his way? Not only a religious leaders, not only their guard, but also a cohort, a battalion, 600, 10th of a legion, 600 soldiers. They're in that pack, most likely the same group that we have here. And Jesus stands and he doesn't run, but what does he do? What does he do? He speaks three words in this entire battalion, all the religious leaders, all of them foul, not laughing and mocking Jesus, but fall to the ground absolutely helpless before him. Listen, at any moment during this derision, this degrading, Jesus, he could have done what? He could have stand up, stand it up, rejuvenated his flesh, just like he rejuvenated and healed the flesh of the person who had his ear cut off. There's your sound effect. All right. He could have rejuvenated every piece of him, put back every chunk of skin on his body, stood up and spoke those same words and had every single one of those individuals kneel before him, not in laughter, not considering him a joke, but knowing that he is God in the flesh, in absolute submission. But he doesn't. Why? Because he considers God the Father and you and me worth He considers you and I worth it. He considers God the Father worth sacrificing every element, every shred of his dignity to fulfill the plan that he came up with God God the Father before eternity passed. He considers it worth it to sacrifice every shred of his dignity for you and me. That's encouraging, amen? amen? Let me say it in a lighter, maybe fun way. In a daddy way. All right? When I blast the music and I come in into the living room and I'm just like, I'm going at it. Those are great moves. All right? <laughs> so, when I'm going at it and I'm dancing and the kids are, what? And I'm going, the more weird, the more crazy, the more ad, just whatever, the more I like degrade myself. All right? For the kids, what happens? The more 
fun, the more love fills the room and fills our kids' hearts. The more they enjoy, the more they feel valued, the more just love happens. And you know what? If the shades are open and my neighbors see this white guy who they think can't dance and has no rhythm, (laughs) which I do, (laughs) it doesn't matter. I don't care. Why? Because my kids are so worth it. My dignity, you can throw it out of the window if it's going to encourage my kids. Jesus here, he's not in a fun, cute moment like that. He's in a humiliating situation, a horrifically humiliating situation. Yet it's all for you and me. He's willing to sacrifice himself to that degree. When you read this passage, so often, or I read this passage, so often I can be struck with pity for Christ. But that's the wrong attitude. We should be struck so hard by his love and encouragement that we're driven to praise Christ. Because he considers you and I just that valuable. Listen, there were, in becoming a pastor, there was one thing that I just never expected that, that would happen as often as it does. It's people coming to me in public and in private and saying, I, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know, I don't think I'm of any value. That is a direct lie from Satan. You are worth the derision of God himself. You are worth his dignity and death. Every single one of us are. We are beyond. We are, have immeasurable value. And we see that in the derision, the degrading of Christ here. Let's continue. Let's go on to verse 20. It says, And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put, on his, clo- put his clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, the follower of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. According to John 19, 17, Jesus did start out carrying his own cross. He did start out that way. It would be expected, it would be demanded, and he did start out that way. But here we see Simon of Cyrene, he's now going to carry the cross. And the the question is always, why? Why is this guy randomly up here on the scene, and why is he carrying the cross? Well, from a human perspective, one may say, well, You know what? Jesus, he may have been going too slow for the Romans. You know, Romans were impatient and they just wanted it to happen. He's going too slow and they just want to speed up the process so they randomly compel, force this individual to carry the cross for Christ. Or they're saying, you know what? Jesus was just scourged, the amount of blood loss, the amount of pain, the amount of physical weakness, staying up all night. He is just physically unable to carry the cross at the point, so they compel, they force this individual to do that. And one might say, one might look at Simon and say, you know what, that's just like the classic example of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I totally disagree with that. I 100% disagree with that. Why? Because what are the two focuses on every single crucifixion account? One, we see it's the mockery, it's the derision, it's the joking of Christ that is yes. Horrific, but also encouraging. But second, as I mentioned before, it's God's sovereignty. It's God's hand in every single element of his plan. Uh, Shortly after this in church history, we see in Cyrene, which is a city in Libya, what do we see? Shortly after this, Acts 11.20, What's there? There are churches there. How did they get there? Acts chapter 13, we see Cyrenian leaders popping up in the church. How did they get there? I think it all started right here with a man named Simon who was compelled, who was forced to carry the cross, who probably went to it saying, what is going on? Why am I doing this? This is so unfair. 
This is untimely. This is difficult. What in the world? But I think God had a plan and he was sovereign in every single aspect of it. That he wasn't in the wrong place at the wrong time, but that he was in the exact place God wanted him to be. Because God had a plan to bring the church to Libya and spread the gospel. And we see this man's legacy continue throughout church history. We see his sons, Alexander and Rufus, Acts chapter 16, verse 13. Where are they? They're help building the church, just like Simon built up the church in Libya. We see the sovereign hand of God just absolutely all over verse 21. Every single aspect of this crucifixion account. He is working it all for his good and for his glory. We come across verses often like James 1-2, which says, we can count it all joy when we fall into various trials. 1 Peter 1-6 or Romans 5.3, which says rejoice in our sufferings, or 1 Thessalonians 5.8, which tells us to be thankful in all things. How can we do that with any sense of sincerity? We can do that with any sense of sincerity because God, like he does with Simon, is working all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. All things even for Simon, in this moment, being compelled, entering into the city, randomly being chosen for a difficult, degrading task. And what does God have in mind? Something phenomenal. The salvation of those in Libya, the salvation and building up of the church in Rome. How? Th- I'm encouraged by that. Are you? That's insane. That's the sovereign hand of God all over this. That's him taking this phenomenally difficult scene and saying, it is beautiful. I'm in it. We're going to see that sovereign hand throughout this entire text. But none of this takes this by God's surprise. It takes, this, takes God by surprise. That God isn't absent in any of it. But he is involved in every single detail, despite how horrific it is. Look at verse 22. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. Now, in Latin, Golgotha is translated as Calvary. So that's where we get Calvary, and that's where we sing songs about Calvary, and most of the time, not about Golgotha. Now, why is this place called the place of the skull? There are many theories. Some say, oh, the hillside that Jesus was crucified on from a certain angle, it looks like a skull. Others are a little bit more morbid and they say this is a common place of crucifixion and there are skulls from previous people being crucified on the ground. Other people are even more morbid than that and they say, you know what, and when people or persons are crucified and they can hardly lift their head, uh, what is happening? Oftentimes when birds would come down, eat off the skin of their head and expose their skull. So those are all fine and nice theories, if I can call them nice, but We really have no idea why this place is called the place of the skull other than it communicates death. We also have no idea where this is exactly located. We don't have an idea. Some people think it's at at what's called Gordon's Calvary, which is a hillside that's beautiful. Others say the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. But no one really has an idea of where this crucifixion exactly took place. But what do we know? What do we know about this place? We know from Hebrews 13, 13 that it's outside the city walls. And you say, well, that's interesting, but who cares? Well, it's very important because it points to God's sovereign hand all over, over all of this. Because in the Old Testament, we have a sacrificial law system. And in that sacrificial law system that was supposed to, supposed to be a shadow of Christ, a picture of Christ, what does it say? Within that sacrificial law system, sin offerings are supposed to be taken where? Outside the city. So Jesus, in perfect fulfillment of the picture that God drew in the Old Testament, is taken where? He's taken outside the city as a sin offering for humanity. Perfect fulfillment. Exactly according to plan. God is in control through every single step. Look at the next verse, verse 23. 
and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Psalm 69.21, this is predicted, that this will be offered to Jesus. What's a wine mixed with myrrh? It's sort of like an ancient narcotic meant to lessen the pain. This is predicted in Psalm 69. It's predicted that it will be given unto the Savior, and also the Savior will forsake it. Exactly according to plan. Nothing takes him by surprise. He's involved in every single moment. Look at the next verse. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. Psalm twenty-two, eighteen. 18. What does it say? Exactly what happens here. 1,000 years approximately prior. It says the Savior is going to be crucified. His garments are going to be cast lots for and torn into pieces, except for one. All of it, all of it is not taking God by surprise. All of it is not thwarting God's plan. All of it is falling perfectly in line with exactly what God wants to do. And that sacrifice his son for you and me. Look at the next verse. It says, verse 25, And it was the third hour when they crucified him. Third hour, that's 9 a.m. in the morning. Why is that important? Because Jesus has to be dead by 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Why is that? Because the Passover lamb that pointed to the Savior in the Old Testament was sacrificed when? At 3 o'clock. So Jesus, there's a timetable that has to be followed. So Jesus is on the cross exactly when God wants him to be put on the cross. 9 a.m. from which he's going to suffer and he's going to die at the exact moment that God said it would happen. God is in control every single step of the way. Also here we have this word crucified and it was the third hour when they crucified him. Interesting fact. Crucifixion was invented by the Persians and it was invented in 400 B.C. That's very interesting. Why? Because in Psalm 22, where it tells us that Jesus is going to be pierced in the hands and pierced in the feet, and it describes crucifixion perfectly, when was Psalm 22 written? About a thousand years before Christ? 600 years before crucifixion was invented? How sovereign is our God? We see that throughout every crucifixion prediction, a description of, what, of a suffering that isn't even invented yet. God is absolutely in control in this moment. Look at the next verse, 26. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews, and with them they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. This is in perfect fulfillment of Isaiah 53, verse 12. He's going to be numbered with the transgressors. He's numbered with them. He's considered a criminal just like him. He's crucified with them. God moment once again. Look at the text again. It says in verse 29, And those who passed by derided, derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha! They said it just like that. I was working on that. You would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe those who crucified, those who were crucified with him also reviled him. You just pick apart this passage and you find it all in the Old Testament. All the way down to the physical expression of these mockers. All the way down to the shaking of their heads. All who see me, Psalm 22, prediction of Jesus Christ, thousand years prior. All who see me mock me, they hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Jeremiah 18, 60. Everyone who passes by it is horrified as they should be and shakes his head. I am an object of scorn to my accusers. When they see me, they wag their heads. Every single item in this crucifixion account, every single item 
has not taken God by surprise. He's involved in every single aspect, and he's working every single horrific element out for what? Out for the greatest good. One scholar says it this way. His name is Henry Nguyen. He says, where God's absence is most loudly expressed, God's presence is most profoundly revealed. That's this passage. No one at this scene would be saying, this is such a good God moment. This is a God sighting. God's at work in this. No one. All the followers of Christ that have abandoned Him would be saying, what's going on? What's happening? Where is God in this? And yet that's exactly where God is. Exactly where God is. Working His plan for the ultimate best. Listen, there's really three applications to this message. The first is recognize your value. God considers you worth his derision and death. Recognize your value. God considers you worth his derision and death. Next, recognize the value of others. Those that have hurt you, those that are against you, those that we may look at and say, wow, what are they? They are all worth the derision and death of Jesus. That's how valuable they are. So that, I turn that on myself and say, when I'm speaking negatively of someone, when I'm deriding someone, when someone, I look at someone and say, how in the world could you ever be a benefit to the body of Christ? Who am I saying that to? I'm saying that about and saying that to someone who is worth the derision and death of Jesus Christ. So first, let's recognize how much value God places on each and every single one of us. Next, let's recognize how much value God places on everyone else around us. Everyone else. You know, every character in this story, from every group, from every group, every single one of them, we see people coming to Christ. Roman guard, we're going to see him come to Christ. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders who lead the derision, Acts chapter 6, multiple have come to Christ. One of the thieves on the cross who crucified him, or who was crucified with him, one of them is going to recognize how valuable God thinks, of, thinks he is and turn to Christ. Every single person on the planet, God considers worth his derision and death. How encouraging is that? Lastly, let this fill you with such, such confidence. In the most horrific scene, we see a beautiful scene. In the greatest horror, we see the greatest good. Why? Because God's involved in it. And he's involved in your and my life too. hesitate to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. You know, we've been in a budget process, and it's taken us a long time to get that budget through. Amen? <laughs> Let's just be brutally honest here. And uh, I'll be honest, throughout much of the process, I was freaking out. Like, what's going to happen? Who's at the helm of this? Because I'm not. What is going on? And I just remember a conversation with Dean one morning, and he said, John, God's in control. It all always works out. It all always works out. You know what the story, you know what the good news is? It all is going to work out. We have a God who is sovereign, who's in every single element. Every single one. Let that fill you with confidence. Right now, your sickness is not a mistake. Right now, the hurt you're experiencing, maybe with family or in relationships, that's exactly where God wants you to be. And that's exactly what God is using to bring about His goodness and His glory. Let's pray. Dear God, You're good. You are so good. And You're in every moment.
Nothing thwarts you. Nothing surprises you. You're in control. And you love us. You planned all of this. You planned that your son would be scourged. You planned that your son would be crucified. You planned that your son would be derided for every single one of us and everyone else on the planet. That's undying love. And we rejoice in that. Dear God, we see your sovereign, mighty hand in every single step of the way. Every single step to the cross, you're in it. And that just fills us with absolute confidence. Dear God, I thank you for every single individual in this room. I thank you, Lord, for how they're seeking you and wanting you. And I pray, Lord, you might fill them with abundant encouragement. That they may know beyond the shadow of that a fact that they are immeasurably valuable and can have complete confidence because of who you are and what you've done for us. Dear God, you're good, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.